established, established um, association between symptoms and reflux episodes using two well-known statistical paradigms like symptom index and symptom association probability. And now we are able to um, assess what we call the mean nocturnal baseline impedance, which is a um, way to uh, assess the mucosal integrity, and a clearance uh, mechanism called post uh, reflux swallow induced peristaltic wave. Furthermore, we can analyze the type of gas reflux and um, the whole idea of reflux monitoring is to identify certain phenotypes, mainly the presence of non-erosive reflux disease, the possibility of hypersensitive esophagus, the diagnosis of functional heartburn. We can now identify patients with severe aerophagia and supragastric belching. And we can also now identify a newly recognized pattern of rumination using impedance pH monitoring. Very shortly, I would like to distinguish when, who, and why it's important to measure reflux and when to select the 24 hours catheter based pH impedance or wireless pH monitoring. The indications for wireless pH monitoring are when patients cannot tolerate the pH impedance catheter, when patients have infrequent symptoms and there is a need for reflux symptom association and 24 hours recordings is not enough, when patients have a high clinical suspicion of reflux disease but the 24 hours pH or pH impedance monitoring was negative, and in patients with a very low clinical suspicion for GERD, but we want in any case to rule out GERD in those patients. The indications for catheter-based pH impedance monitoring are a little bit more complicated. They are used in patients with refractory symptoms despite PPI therapy that had a previous evidence of reflux disease uh, diagnosed by a positive pH testing or endoscopic esophagitis grade B, C, or D, or they have histology proven Barrett's esophagus or a peptic stricture. In patients with respiratory symptoms or disease potentially triggered by reflux, like cough, or prone to deterioration from reflux-related microaspiration, for example, in pulmonary fibrosis, in cystic fibrosis, and lung transplantation. In patients with repetitive belching with or without concurrent typical GERD symptoms, like heartburn or regurgitation. In patients with suspicion of rumination with increased postprandial regurgitation refractory to PPI treatment, and in patients with persistent reflux symptoms and or increased belching after anti-reflux surgery or endoscopic GERD procedures. I will discuss more in detail all these aspects of pH impedance monitoring. Let's discuss what is the advantage of impedance pH over pH only. This is performed with a uh, recorded that is able to monitor several impedance channels and one or two pH um, sensors. In this case, six impedance channels and one esophageal sensor in green and one esophageal sensor in red, one gastric sensor in red. So how, how impedance is measuring reflux? The catheter contains electrodes that are able to detect changes in electrical conductivity. If the mollus is moving downwards, like in this situation, like in a swallow, what you see is that there is an impedance drop that sequentially moved in a 
um, direction from mouth to stomach. In contrast, if the liquid is moving upwards, like in a reflux episode, you can see that the impedance will record very similar, but the direction is the opposite. So this is a reflux episode detected by impedance. When you combine the impedance with a pH sensor, you can then describe the occurrence of reflux and you can characterize reflux as acid or weakly acidic or alkaline, being the last two, weakly acidic and alkaline, consider what we now call non-acid reflux. So what is the advantage of impedance pH monitoring? I will discuss these six different advantages. First, to exclude artifacts that you cannot do with pH metry. Then, to detect non-acid reflux events. Obviously, you cannot do that with pH metry. To assess air or gas movements in aerophagia and belching. To assess the baseline mucosal integrity and to look at this post-reflux swallow-induced peristaltic wave, and finally to uh, try to determine whether a patient with postprandial regurgitations have actually a rumination syndrome. Let's give me an example of excluding artifacts. This is a pH tracing in which you can see that there is a pH drop going below 4, in this situation, in the middle, and in the, um, this situation. So the pH metry will include these pH drops in the assessment of the total esophageal acid exposure. However, when we look at the concurrent impedance tracing, we can see that at the time of the pH drops, there are spikes in the impedance. Those spikes represent movement of air. Impedance drops represent movement of liquid, but impedance spikes represent movement of air. So one can think here that in fact the patient had these pH drops due to belch-related acid reflux episodes. However, when you expand this tracing more, we could see that, in fact, those pH drops were due to um, anti-grade movements of combined air and liquid. In fact, the patient was drinking Coca-Cola. So impedance can tell when a pH drop is a real reflux episode or it is an artifact that needs to be identified in order to exclude the pH drop for the assessment of the acid exposure. As I said, impedance can detect non-acid reflux episodes. We know that impedance can detect acid, non-acid, and the detection of non-acid reflux episodes is relevant because non-acid reflux is associated with symptoms and sometimes symptoms of regurgitation or chest pain. Particularly important is to identify patients that have symptoms related to non-acid reflux. You know that from 100 patients that have heartburn, there is a percentage of patients that have esophagitis or complications, and in blue, the patients that have a normal endoscopy. Out of them, around 40 have true NERD, and then there are patients that have hypersensitivity, either to acid or to non-acid reflux episodes. So that is why it's important to identify the non-acidic reflux events, which you cannot do with pH metry. Even more important is in the pediatric population. In babies, regurgitations of liquid mainly is non-acidic, and you cannot identify that with pH. So these are non-acidic reflux episodes detected in neonites or uh, very young children that are under continuous feeding. 
So in pediatric studies, it is critical to perform reflux monitoring with pH impedance much more than with pH metry. So we can assess refractory patients that are not responding to PPIs and see whether they have this refractoriness associated to non-acid reflux. We can identify patients with functional heartburn from patients with non-erosive reflux disease based on the impedance pattern. And we can mainly identify patients, pediatric patients, under continuous feeding and neonates and see whether they have an exaggerated amount of non-acid reflux. What about aerophagia and belching? As I said, air movement is detected in impedance as spikes. And you can see that these are the meal periods of a subject that is undergoing MII pH recording. And during the meal periods, you can see the, that the subject has enormous amount of spikes moving all the way from the proximal to the distal esophagus. This pattern suggests that the subjects have aerophagia during the meals. And the consequence of this is that they can have, after the meals, acid and non-acid reflux related to gastric belching, secondary to the increased aerophagia during the meals. Very interestingly, we identified a group of patients that were PPI refractory that had this specific pattern. In other words, they had aerophagia during the meals and increased acid and non-acid reflux associated to gastric belching that were not responding to PPIs. The treatment of these patients, of course, is treating the aerophagia that requires a change in diet and a specific position of the head relative to the meal. Impedance can detect air movement. As I said, the air in impedance implies increase in impedance. And you can see here that there is an increase in impedance that starts from the distal part and goes the way up to the proximal part, suggesting that the air is coming from the stomach into the esophagus. This is what we call a gastric belching. The liquid is following that air movement, and you can see that there is also a pH drop, suggesting that this is a gastric belch that is producing a liquid acid reflux episode. In contrast, in this situation, the air is moving from the upper part to the distal part, and then the liquid is moving to the stomach, up to into the esophagus. This is a completely different situation. This is what we call supragastric belching, which is a behavioral disorder that can be managed with cognitive behavioral therapy. This is an example of a supragastric belching that is producing an acid liquid reflux episode. This is one very significant and common situation that we are finding more and more, particularly in patients refractory to PPI treatment. So, as I said, impedance can detect movements of air. Depending on the direction of the air, we can identify individuals with aerophagia and gastric belching or individuals with supragastric belching. We can assess the pathophysiology of reflux induced by gastric or supragastric belching, and we can monitor the frequency of these belches episodes and follow up the treatment, either pharmacological with baclofen or um, with cognitive behavioral therapy. Another possibility that brings impedance is to measure what we call the baseline impedance. In between swallows or reflux episodes, the impedance tracing is very stable and it reflects the condition of the mucosa. 
if you have a mucosa that is damaged, that damage provokes leak of movement of ions across the mucosa, and this movement of ions across the mucosa produces a change in electrical conductivity that goes down. The, the, the patient has a higher electrical conductivity, meaning that has a lower impedance. So in individuals with a pathological mucosa, the baseline impedance is low. In controls, is around 3,000 ohms, whereas in patients with disease, the baseline impedance is below 1,500 ohms. So the measurement of baseline impedance gives us an idea of the status of the mucosa, and we now know that patients with a low baseline impedance are those that have a higher acid exposure, and we now know even more that they have also a higher bile exposure that provokes changes in the mucosal impedance in patients that have nothing in the endoscopy, in non-erosive reflux disease patients. Then there is another parameter which reflects the clearance mechanism in the esophagus. You can see here that there is a reflux episode that is acid and it is detected by impedance. Immediately after that reflux episode, there is a movement of impedance moving in the opposite direction and this movement of impedance is associated with a correction of the pH. Why? Because this is a swallow that is bringing saliva down into the esophagus and that saliva contains bicarbonate and the bicarbonate is neutralizing the acidity of the esophageal mucosa. So this is what we call the post-reflux swallow-induced peristaltic wave. This is a reflex normal in healthy subjects which is failing in some patients with reflux disease. And when we have this reflex absent or failing, this has one diagnostic uh, properties. We can identify patients with reflux disease just by knowing that the PSPW is low or pathologic. And it has also um, predictive value for treatments. We know that patients with a low PSPW are responding different to PPI or surgical treatment than those that have a normal PSPW. So the Italian groups, uh, particularly from Dr. Frazzoni and Savarino, have used these two parameters, the PSPW and the baseline impedance, to try to improve the diagnosis of reflux using MIIPH in patients with inconclusive diagnosis of reflux just based on esophageal acid exposure or endoscopy. So as I said, the new parameters like the PSPW and the MNBI uh, are able to increase the diagnostic yield in patients with inconclusive diagnosis of GERD. Finally, uh, we now know that many patients that, had, that have a refractory reflux disease uh, described as persistent postprandial regurgitation might have what we call uh, a behavioral disorder known as rumination syndrome. Until now, the diagnosis of rumination syndrome was done using the ROM4 criteria and other criteria, asking to, that the patients have an effortless re regurgitation after the meals, um, and they, they re-swallow sometimes the material or spit it out. The diagnosis is currently confirmed using a combination of manometry with impedance that has a, a post, is, is, a, is a test that needs a um, um, test meal and assessment of the postprandial period, which is the 
let's say, the gold standard for the diagnosis of rumination, and has a very specific pattern, both of the manometry and the impedance change. However, we studied recently um, the pattern observed in uh, reflux monitoring with impedance pH metry in patients with confirmed diagnosis of rumination. And we found such pattern. This is the meal period that you can see with a black line. And you can see that after the meal period, there are many symptomatic non-acidic reflux episodes detected by impedance. If this is a time scale of half an hour, you can see that in the first half an hour, this subject has like 10 episodes. This is very typical of a rumination syndrome. You can see these are episodes of non-acidic uh, liquid coming all the way up to the throat, and the patient marked two out of four of them as symptomatic. In our um, experience, patients with more than four or five episodes like this, symptomatic in the postprandial period, are likely to have a rumination syndrome. So, as I said, impedance pH is very important for the understanding of PPI refractoriness, and it is now a new tool to confirm or diagnose the suspicions of a rumination syndrome in someone with um, persistent uh, postprandial regurgitations. So to summarize, the advantage of impedance pH monitoring over simple pH, either catheter based or wireless, is that it is easy to exclude non-reflux artifacts, it's possible to diagnose non-acid reflux, it's possible to assess air or gas movement and to make diagnosis of aerophagia and characterize the type of belching. It's possible to have an idea of the mucosal integrity, knowing that a baseline impedance which is lower than 1500 ohms is pathological regardless of the appearance in the endoscopy. We can now identify uh, mechanisms of clearance with the new parameter of the post reflux swallow induced peristaltic wave, and we finally are able to diagnose rumination syndrome. I think that the use of impedance and pH metry is becoming more and more specific for this kind of problems, whereas the diagnosis of um, um, typical heartburn reflux without other symptoms in adults can be perfectly be made with wireless prolonged pH monitoring. These two techniques are not necessarily enemies to each other. They are complementary. In some patients, it's better to use the um, 24 hours catheter-based impedance pH monitoring because these patients have one of these uh, problems that I have just described. And in other patients, it is enough to perform a reflux monitoring with a um, wireless capsule and be able to perform a 48 up to 96 hours of recording. Okay, this was my uh, presentation of uh, today in terms of theoretical things. Now what we like to uh, discuss with you real life monitoring uh, studies of patients with reflux disease. Yes, thanks for that very clear uh, summary of the uh, advantages, Prof. So we just remind everyone while you're preparing your uh, presentation on how you use the software that if anyone has questions to uh, type them into the chat area and then hopefully we'll have a, a few minutes after your presentation if 
Uh, so we're just waiting for Prof to share his screen with the software tracings on. Yeah, I have a little problem. Okay, now I'm fine. So if you, if you share your screen on that, Prof, presently we can see uh, you and your office, but we cannot see the screen. Can you see it now? Uh, not yet, Prof, no. not yet. <coughs> Anthony, you can... Uh, have you shared, so you want to share desktop one? Yeah, I will do that now. That's kind of lovely, Prof. Uh, just make it noise for Windows. Okay. With the green button. Perfect. All right. Perfect, Prof. Thanks. Good. So, for all of you that are not familiar with um, impedance pH monitoring, this is a real life tracing, a 24 hour tracing of a lady with typical reflux symptoms. In the upper part of the uh, monitor, you can see the periods that are during the, the study in light blue, the supine periods, then the pink are the meal periods marked by the patient, and then there are symptoms marked by the patient. Then we have six impedance recordings in the esophageal body and then we have one pH sensor five centimeters above the lower esophageal sphincter and one pH sensor in the stomach. In several centers people is only using one pH sensor in the esophagus. In our center we prefer to use two, one in the esophagus and one in the stomach and I will if there are questions about this, I will justify why. In any case, I would like to go through with you our routine methodology to analyze one of these studies. The first thing I am trying to see is whether there are obvious artifacts in the impedance channels, the PA channels or the gastric esophageal or gastric pH. And I can see that in this tracing, there are no artifacts. The second um, step is to check whether the markers that the patient set during the study are correct. And let me tell you that I love our patients, but unfortunately, many times they are not using the markers that we ask them to use in the right way and that can provoke significant errors in the analysis of our tracings and you will see that. In order to know that this meal period is correct I expand the tracing in time and I can see that the patient had an initial little short meal period, then nothing happened, and then, then the patient marked a prolonged meal period. However, I agree with the timing of the first meal period, but why? Because when I analyze the sequence of swallowing, I realize that there is a very fast frequency of swallowing, and there is an increase in gastric pH, suggesting that the subject is eating or drinking something with a higher pH than the acid that was in the stomach. In this case, the patient marked his reflux, his meal period until here. Okay, I agree with that and I leave it. In contrast, when I look at this period here, I see that the frequency of the swallowing started earlier than what he marked and finished much earlier than what he marked. So what I am doing now is to correct this to that timing and I will put the end of the meal here. And this is very important because you will 
in this case is not the case, but you will see that by adjusting the meal period, you will avoid having a reflux episodes or regurgitation episodes that happened in a period that in fact the patient was eating. So once I finish this period and I see that the marker is correct, I go to the next and I move my cursor to the next. In this situation, the patient definitely started his meal here and if you compare the swallow frequency of this period compared to that period definitely is eating and the end of the meal is correct. So I leave it like this. Then, surprise, I found that in fact not only he changed the frequency of uh, uh, eating here but also there is a clear gastric change in pH. So suggesting that in fact the patient stopped the meal period here, but it's wrong. He was still having a dessert or something after the meal, so I prolonged the meal period. In that way, that here, that pH drop here, is likely to be part of the meal rather than a real reflux episode. So then I go farther in my tracing and I have the next meal period here. Here, again, I see that the patient marked the beginning of the meal and the end of the meal there. Now the question is, is true that the meal starts here or it started earlier and this pH drop is part of the meal? No, I have another trick that I want to teach you. The meal always provoke a deep drop in impedance in the distal channel. You can see here that if I amplify this, that the real drop, in fact, the meal starts a little bit earlier there. When the last channel is touching the black line there. And all this time definitely is the start of the meal. The question is where this is part of the meal and the answer is yes because the frequency of swallowing of this compared to that side and that side is definitely higher so I believe and there is also a change in gastric pH so I believe that the patient marked the meal correctly. Then I continue this is the supine period and I go until the next morning and there is the, this is the next meal. You can clearly see here that the meal provokes this change in frequency of swallowing together with the increase in gastric pH. So this meal marking is correct. And then I go to the end and I finish the assessment of the whole of the meal periods. Then I go back to the complete tracing and I wonder whether the supine period is correct. And you can see here that this part is correct because it coincides with a clear decrease in frequency of swallowing. When someone is sleeping, does not swallow. So this is a typical pattern of a supine sleeping period. In contrast, at the beginning of the tracing, I don't know why, there is a marking of a supine period. So we cannot use that because the patient was definitely not in supine position at the beginning of the study. So if this will, kept, if we keep it, it will be added to the total analysis time of the supine period, which I want to avoid. So I do that and I delete it. I want to delete that period and I delete it. So now I have already identified the meal periods and the supine periods and there is something else that I want to know. I want to know if the mean impedance baseline is normal or it is low. And I want to know it now from the very beginning of the study. And the, or, the way to do that is that I take the ruler of the tracing, I select the supine period, 
and I reach the values of the mean impedance. In the very distal channel is 1438, 1763, 53. So the impedance baseline during the night is normal. And why I want to know this from the very beginning? Because in patients with normal baseline impedance, the automatic software recognition of reflux episodes is much better and reliable. In contrast, in patients with low baseline impedance, due to a difficulty for the software to identify reflux, the manual editing of the reflux episodes is much more um, important. So that is why I want to know from the very beginning whether the baseline impedance, particularly in the distal channels, is normal or not. Okay, so this is the first step. A visual inspection, all this takes three to five minutes, not more. Then I go to the software of the program to request for the automatic analysis, which I ask there, and the the program is now going to perform the automatic analysis to identify reflux episodes. It takes less than one minute to do that. Okay, we are almost there. All right, so the software finished identifying the reflux episodes and it put a yellow mark in each of the reflux episodes in the 24 hours recording. So now the next step is to edit and correct what the automatic software did. Most of the times we need to delete false positives rather than add false negatives. Let me show you the way we do it. First, we need to change the time scale and we put a window of five minutes. So it means these are five minutes windows. Then I want to go to the reflux episodes identified by the program. So there is a go to reflux and I go to the first. This is a reflux episode that was acid. There is air coming up at the beginning and there is liquid. To me, it's perfect. But there is something that I want to know. Is that a gastric belch or a supragastric belch related to the acid reflux episode? So I need to expand this and have a look. So definitely there is a belch. Is this gastric or supragastric? And it depends on the direction of the movement of air. I cannot see it in this uh, time scale, so I, I need to further expand. And now I take the cursor, which is this red line, and I use it to see the movement of the air. And I can see that the air moved from the distal part up to the proximal part. So this is a gastric belch. Then I go back to my previous view and I go to my next reflux. This is again a reflux episode, acid. I go to the next. This is another acid reflux episode. I want to know if this is gastric or supragastric belch. I expand one time, I expand another time, I take my cursor and I move it to see what happens first. And again, you can see that the air started 
first in the distal part and move more proximal. So this is a gastric belch. You don't have to do this with all the reflux episodes, but with a few to have an idea of the pattern in this particular patient. In general, patients have a clear pattern. Either most of the belches are gastric or most of them are supragastric. Then I go to the next. Again, another belch-related reflux episode. We expand and we expand again. And I take the cursor and again is going first in the distal and then in the proximal. So the pattern in this patient is definitely gastric belched related acid reflux. And so I go to all of the reflux episodes and I keep them if I agree that they are reflux episodes and so far I have. But look at this. This is very short. There is a swallow here and the program thought that this was a reflux episode. I disagree. This is very similar to that, which is a swallow. So I want to delete this. I expanded a little bit. I expanded a little bit and I put right mouse button and I delete it and I go back to the initial view. And then I go to the next. I think that this is an acid reflux episode to the next. This is an acid reflux episode. And here, again, there is a problem. You see that the patient suddenly changed the swallow frequency. It is difficult to identify a clear reflux episode here. And this can be part of drinking something that I missed at the initial analysis. So I want to know whether this is real reflux or part of a drinking. I need to expand to see what happens. And what happens is that in fact, this is real reflux. This is swallowing, but this is belching. And the belching is associated with a liquid retrograde flow starting here. So I think that even if I suspected initially that this was part of the drinking, no, the patient first belched and had an acid and then started to drink. And I go to the next. This is a liquid reflux episode, another, these are very short lasting. This is another very short lasting. In fact, you need to change the time scale. And if you don't like the, that time scale, you can put it into two minutes and then you can see better the duration of the reflux episodes. This is a reflux episode. This is a long lasting reflux episode with a pH drop. This is another belch related reflux episode. I want to know if it is gastric or supragastric. And I can tell you that it's gastric just from the very beginning. You can see that the distal channel increases the impedance before the proximal. All right. I go to the next. And this is something very interesting. If I explain you earlier today the concept of the PSPW. This is an acid reflux episode that finishes here. But the program interpreted that the reflux episode ended there. However, I can, I can tell you that the reflux episode, in fact, finished there and finished here and finished there and finish here. And you can see now that this is the acid liquid reflux episode, which was followed by a swallow that is provoking a clearance in the acid. So what is this? This is the famous PSPW event. This is an acid reflux episode. This is another. This is another, and this is another, and this is another. And so 
here happens something that I would like to show you. Until now, I was choosing and keeping or deleting the reflux episodes diagnosed by the program. But now I found a pH drop that is suspicious of being acid reflux because there is no, uh, there is an impedance drop moving upwards in that direction. So I want to add one reflux episode to what the program was mean, um, um, missing. So I decide to, se to select that, that region and to add uh, um, a reflux episode. So I need to add a liquid reflux episode that starts here and finishes there. So now I know that this is a liquid reflux episode that provoked that pH drop. Okay, I continue. In this case, for example, is a more complicated situation. You see that the program identified this little drop here, but the pH drop started earlier. So in my impression, the reflux episode in fact started there and it has there, and it goes there, but you cannot see very well the liquid drop because of the air artifact. But in my mind, that pH drop occurs because of this long lasting impedance drop in this channel. And then I keep doing this until the end of the trace. This, for example, is a beautiful example of a PSPW. You can see that there is a reflux episode, that there is a um, swallow, and that swallow is associated with a pH improvement. This is a typical example of a PSPW. And then you go and finish all the analysis of the tracing, and when you finish all the editing that can take you, depending on the tracing and depending on the difficulties and depending on the number of subject, the, the reflux and, and symptoms that the patient had, you can go to the report of the study. But before doing that, I would like to show you something. That is the editing of the symptoms rather than editing of the reflux. You go to all and you can see that this patient, each of these vertical dot lines is a symptom that you can see them here and you can see them there. So it's very important that you um, delete when the patient pushes the symptom marker too many times instead of one time. Let me give you an example. If I look at this period here, So when, if you can see, this is a three minutes time window. The patient pushed the symptom one here, symptom one here, symptom one here. This is correct because the patient pushed three different symptoms, separated each other more than two or three minutes. So you don't have to delete them. The problem is when the symptom, the patient is marking a symptom very close to one to the other. If you put it like there, Suppose that the patient marked the two symptoms like this, very close to each other, meaning that he pushed twice the event marker just for one symptom perception, because he was not sure. If you leave the two, that will interfere and will affect the reflux symptom association analysis. So you need to delete the second one and keep only one. And this is very important in the editing of a tracing because your reflux symptom association analysis will be very much affected when there are too many symptoms pushed as a repetition of the event marker. So once you did the editing of the symptoms, then you are ready to go and ask for a report. So you ask for the report. 
and the program is generating automatically a report, which is this. The first thing that the program, that what you want to do in, in the report is to select the items that you want to see in your report. I am interested in the acid exposure. I am interested in the Demister score. I am interested in the number of reflux episodes on a reflux table. I'm not interested at this moment on bolus clearance time or exposure time. There are several parameters that can be calculated but are not the most relevant. I am interested on the mill nocturnal baseline impedance calculated by the program. And this program is able to measure this now. It's a modern program. I prefer to look at the PSPW index manually, not automatically, because this depends very much on the identification of reflux episodes that you need to edit. And the program is calculating this before editing, so I prefer to do it manually. I'm not very interested in the postprandial data, and I am interested in the symptom reflux correlation analysis. And finally, I am interested in the diagnosis. So I ticked all this before generating now the, the report, and I can see an initial figure of the tracing, which is what you have seen before. And I can see that the patient had a total acid exposure of 5.8%, an upright acid exposure of 9.8%, and a supine of 1.3%. In this uh, software, the normal values are still based on a period before the Lyon consensus uh, um, report, and it was considered total normal less than 4.2%. We now consider 6% as total normal, uh, but definitely this patient has a pathological upright acid reflux. Then I look at the number of reflux episodes in the reflux table, and the total number was 45, being 34 acid, and 11 non-acid, which is within the normal range. Then I look at the mean nocturnal baseline impedance and the program already calculated automatically. And you can see that in the distal two channels, the values are above 1400, which is what we consider the cutoff to consider that the mucosa is normal or not. There are other papers from Italian groups that have a higher cutoff, but we have recently uh, published a large series of normal subjects in which we know that in normal subjects the good cutoff is around 1500 ohms. And then we look at the symptoms for reflux symptom association analysis, and we look at the patient had four heartburn episodes, and three of the four were related, so he has a symptom index of 75% and a symptom association probability of 99.9%, meaning that this subject has clear reflux symptom association positive for heartburn. We really don't look at belching as a symptom for reflux symptom analysis, because this is another type of symptom that we are not interested in now. And then what he marked as symptom one and symptom two, I need to go and read the paper data of this patient, but symptom one was 14 times, half of which were positive and half of which were negative, suggesting that the symptom index is positive and the SAP also positive. So definitely this patient had a pathological upright acid exposure with a positive reflux symptom association, and a normal MNBI, suggesting that the mucosa is not affected. This is a NERD patient, and he will probably respond well to PPIs or anti-reflux surgery. I would finish with this uh, tracing, and I would like to just show you how it looks, uh, another tracing, to give you an idea of how we do this. If you take, for example, this 
other tracing, there is something that calls your attention initially, that is the end of the tracing. The patient finished the study, the nurse took off the catheter and all this part of the tracing needs to be excluded because this is still recording when the catheter was outside the tracing. So the way to exclude this, you put the right mouse button there, you say exclude area and you do this and you do that and this area now is excluded for the automatic analysis and the measurement of the total acid exposure. Again, the next step is to look at the technical quality. That was part of that. I looked at the now the meal periods and the first thing that I see is that something happens here with the pH Something happens here with the frequency of swallowing, but the patient didn't mark correctly the meal period. So I need to open this. Definitely, the, he marked just the end and he forgot to mark the beginning. So you need to mark the beginning because all this here is the meal. You can see that there is a drop in impedance in the last channel touching the base. You can see that there is an increase in gastric pH and you can see that this is finishing more or less at the time that he put the first marker. In this way, you are avoiding false negative analysis. This meal here is pretty good, but he marked by mistake that as a supine period, which you need to delete. And then you continue and this meal period to me is much longer because look at the frequency of swallowing here. So I would think that this finishing there. And then I continue. I think that this is correct. And I continue. And again, there is something very interesting. The patient was in supine position, then he stood up probably earlier than that because he started swallowing much more here and he started to have some acid reflux episodes and then there is a meal. Well, I believe that there is no meal here because the impedance baseline doesn't move much and there is no much gastric change. However, the real meal start here, probably his breakfast. And when you have several like little pieces of meal like this, marked like this, what we train to do is to combine them all in one single, in one single meal period. And then I am happy with the editing of the meal periods and the technicalities. Then I go back to the total tracing and I want to know if the impedance baseline is good or not. So I go to the ruler, I select all the supine period, but wait a minute, something is wrong here because there is no supine marker here. So the patient forgot to push the supine button at the start of the supine period. So I need to make sure that this is all considered a supine period because otherwise the analysis will be completely wrong. Now I can do the impedance baseline and see what is going on. I look at that and I can see that the impedance baseline in this subject is also normal. 2,148, 1,944. Therefore, it means that the, mil, um, that, the, that the baseline impedance is good and that the software will be doing well 
during the um, analysis of individual reflux events. Something else I wanted to show you during this, uh, in, in this tracing. If you open up this, I need to get out of here. If you open up this meal period here, you can see that this subject has some aerophagia during the meal, during this meal. But if you go to the next meal, definitely the subject is swallowing a lot of air. You can see this spiking here going all the way down from the proximal to the distal esophagus. This subject has clearly aerophagia that you need to report when you analyze this kind of tracings. Let me show you this. Every time he swallows, there is air movement coming into the stomach and also the stomach. So you can see now that it is very important to look. This is the next meal. Look at the aerophagia that he is having. Enormous amount of air that you have to report. And I think that that uh, I wanted to show you just one more minute, um, something else on another tracing to give you just some examples of things that can happen. Again, in this tracing, you need to um, exclude this area that is after the end of the recording. You need to take the meal periods and you open here and you look at the meal periods that are right in the right position and you do the same with the next meal but there was something in this tracing that I noticed that I wanted to show. This is a, another meal here and I want to expand and again you can see that there is a lot of air swallowing during the meal. The consequence of this air swallowing during a meal is what happens in the postprandial period. Look at this. Immediately after the meal, the patient has several reflux episodes. And if you expand this here, he had belching. And this is gastric belching is moving from below to above. Let's have a look at this one. If I put the cursor here, I can see that first the air came in the lower part and then in the upper part. So this is a case of aerophagia during meals and postprandial belch-induced acid reflux. This is very important because this contributes to the total acid exposure in this patient, and this is not solved by PPI. So you need to uh, learn to identify aerophagia and postprandial gastric reflux. With this, I will stop here, and I will be very happy to answer your questions. So, uh, hi, Prof. Uh, we've had a few questions, uh, and uh, uh, one of them, uh, so I'll try and start from perhaps the easier ones to the more complicated ones. Uh, one person asked, why would you use a gastric channel? Okay. Uh, the first thing to make it very simple is that the price difference between a catheter with a only one sensor in the esophagus and two sensors, one for the esophagus and one on the stomach, is around to 20 pounds. So there is no much impact in the cost. The recording lasts the same and the analysis of the gastric channel is very helpful in my mind for two things. The first is that it tells you 
when you are studying patients on PPIs, whether the patient has enough effect of the PPI, because you can see the gastric pH and you can see whether there is still acid or not in the stomach when the patient was studied on his typical dose of PPI. It also helps me to identify the meal periods as I show you earlier today. You can clearly see when the subject is eating or drinking by looking at the gastric pH change. Thank you. Uh, another question was regarding the time. What do you think is the minimal optimal recording time for catheter-based uh, reflux monitoring that can really represent a 24-hour impedance test? What are your thoughts on uh, between 12 hours versus 16 hours? Well, we take 15 hours as our cutoff, and when we have a less than 15 hours, we report the result of the study, but we say that it might be not 100% representative of the thing. If we have less than 12 hours, we simply do not report it, and we said that the study was incomplete. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question just come in. Uh, if the basal mucosal impedance is low, is this enough to diagnose erosive esophagitis? No, it is enough to diagnose reflux disease, not erosive esophagitis, because erosive esophagitis is an endoscopic diagnosis that requires the visualization of erosions in the endoscopy. The low baseline impedance can be seen in the absence of erosions in NERD. And it is very useful to diagnose NERD when you do not see erosions in the endoscopy. So the answer to the question is no. The low baseline impedance is a microscopic diagnosis that um, is very useful when you don't see esophagitis. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, another person asked, what do you take to be your normal range for impedance episodes? What do you take to be your normal range for impedance episodes? If the, if the question implies the number of reflux episodes, which is, I, I think that is what is asking, the number of reflux episodes, in the past, I used to take 73 based on previous studies that we did as a cutoff. But now we know that above 50 reflux episodes is likely to be more pathological. So I am more and more convinced that when a subject has less than 50 reflux episodes, the number of total reflux episodes is normal. When a, subject, when a, a subject has between 50 and 80, it is likely to be pathological. And when it is above 80, it's clearly pathological. Thank you. Uh, one person has asked, uh, how do you know if the patient is supine if they've forgotten to mark it on the box? How do you know if they're supine? Because when someone is sleeping, the swallowing frequency is completely different and almost abolished. While you are awake, the frequency of swallowing is between two or three, or one and three per minute. So in 60 minutes, you have 60 swallows, at least. Right. When you are in supine position at, and sleeping, the swallowing frequency is almost neglectable. So you see a flat line most of the time. That helps you to identify the supine period. Oh, the line is flat. Uh, thank you. Another question was, if there is a discrepancy between SI and SAP, what should one do? What would you do? We currently accept a positive reflux symptom association when both tests are positive. If one of the two is negative and the other is positive, we do not accept it as a positive reflux symptom association. And we, um, we believe that no. this needs to be a very strong definition because both the symptom index and the SAP are pretty weak 
ways of measuring this. So at least two week positive help me to be more convinced. Uh, this one, it's about recommending surgery. Not sure if you would do this, but do you recommend surgery for a hypersensitive esophagus? What is the usual outcome? Okay. I can answer this question based on a relatively new study by Dr. Spechler in the US, published in New England Journal of Medicine last year. That study shows that if you have a patient that has non-erosive reflux disease and a typical clear-cut association between reflux events and typical symptoms, only typical symptoms, heartburn or regurgitation, nothing else, no other symptom, and they have a clear-cut positive reflux symptom association with normal acid exposure, this is what we call hypersensitive esophagus, those patients went to anti-reflux surgery and or a medical treatment in a randomized controlled trial, and those that were operated did very well. So now I am confident that if you have a positive reflux symptom association, and a, but I, I want to insist, it should be clear cut both symptom index and SAP clear cut positive, and the symptoms should be typical, heartburn or regurgitation, nothing in the throat, nothing of cough, nothing of globus, nothing of that. Heartburn or regurgitation, and they do very well. Thank you. Uh, going back uh, to the first case, uh, someone's mentioned that the first case had abnormal acid exposure, but about 40 reflux episodes. How would you explain this? How do you explain this? The correlation between the number of reflux episodes and the acid exposure is not good because there are reflux episodes that are poorly cleared and the acid exposure is long and there are reflux episodes that are rapidly clear and the acid exposure is very short. So it's very difficult to correlate the number of reflux episodes and the acid exposure. If I have to choose between both parameters to define whether a patient has reflux disease or not, I still believe that the acid exposure is more robust. So 40 reflux episodes, but an acid exposure of 8.5, the patient has reflux disease. All right. Uh, this question is a little bit long, Prof. Uh, if impedance monitoring is performed off PPI, and the esophageal AET is greater than 4%, but the total number of reflex uh, uh, is greater than 80 times over a 24-hour period. Could this be dis diagnosed as GERD? So that's the off-PPI, esophageal AET greater than 4%, but total reflux number is greater than 80 times over a 24-hour period. Can we diagnose as GERD? Well, what I can tell you is that no. The, my answer will be no. And the reason being the following. If you have 80 reflux episodes that only generate an acid exposure of four, it means that these were very fast reflux episodes, very short lasting reflux episodes. When I find that most of these are in fact belches rather than clear reflux episodes. Oh. And I would like to know whether those 80 were manually recognized or just read from the report of automatic analysis. I, get, I guess that it is the second, the case that the 80 was coming from the automatic analysis without editing and most of them will be belches. Mm -hmm. Because, in general, if they are real reflux episodes with liquid uh, containing acid, it's very unlikely that 80 reflux episodes will only produce a 4% acid exposure. Uh, another person, thank you, another person said, if the acid exposure is high, do you really care whether there is a symptom correlation or not? Does it matter? 
Well, that is a very good question. So you are doing reflux monitoring in a patient that had normal endoscopy. Otherwise, you don't do reflux monitoring. So the patient does not have esophagitis. So you have increased acid exposure and you want to know if the patient has positive or negative reflux symptom association. In the case of an increased acid exposure and the, and, the, and the symptoms are typical, like heartburn, then you are right. I don't mind. If the patient has an 8% acid exposure and heartburn was not clearly associated, I still believe that this is reflux disease. The problem is with the patient that have atypical symptoms. And then you ask yourself, you suppose that the patient has a um, throat discomfort or globus. And then you ask yourself the relationship between the acid exposure and the um, symptom association analysis. In that case, I prefer not to use the reflux symptom association and just respect the acid exposure. Uh, a question here, thank you, a question here regarding anti-reflux surgery. Do you recommend anti-reflux surgery for severe erosive esophagitis or Barrett's esophagus? The answer is, this, this was not a webinar on reflux disease. No, that's, I think it's a bit off. However, I cannot escape the answer, and my answer is yes. Uh, when in a... Uh, in a patient who has grade, somebody asked, in a patient who has grade B, C and D grade esophagitis on endoscopy, do you still need to do a pH study? Some surgeons insist on it. So that's in a patient who has grade B or C and D grade esophagitis on endoscopy, do you still need to do a pH study? Some surgeons have insisted on it. If I have grade C or D, I agree that there is no much need of an, uh, reflux monitoring. Uh, uh, if it is B, I think that it is because there are still some subjects that are normal that can have esophagitis grade B, and that is why the Lyon consensus decided to take B as an inconclusive diagnosis of GER. So for C or D, then the question is why the surgeons want to see uh, a reflux monitoring preoperative. And the answer is that they want to have uh, documentation of the preoperative amount of reflux that the patient have to be sure that what happens in the postoperative period. If the patient still has symptoms postoperative, they want to check whether in a second reflux monitoring whether there was a reduction or not of reflux due to the surgery. So I agree that for the, it is not necessary for diagnosis of reflux disease. The diagnosis is done by the endoscopy. It nice. is more useful for the follow-up. Thank you. Uh, one question on the symptom association. What time after the reflux event is the symptom association calculated? Depends. For the symptom index is five minutes, and for the symptom association probability, two minutes. Lovely, thank you. A uh, bit of a long question. When normal AT, normal acid exposure time, but we found lots of mixed gas liquid episodes occurred, patients just perceive only gas and report as belch symptoms on those episodes. Can we report this as reflux hypersensitivity to belch? No. The reflux hypersensitivity diagnosis is reserved for heartburn, regurgitation, and chest pain, not for belch. Uh, I think someone's gone back to the surgery recommendations. It's not about... Uh, why do you recommend surgery in Barrett's and severe erosive esophagitis? I'm not sure if you actually did recommend, but that was the question just come through. Why do you recommend surgery in Barrett's and severe erosive esophagitis? 
I think that depends that this depends on the mechanisms of reflux that the patient has. If a patient has uh, a hiatus hernia larger than three centimeters with bipositional reflux, meaning during daytime and during the night, with an acid exposure severely increased, and endoscopic diagnosis of esophagitis grade COD, the patient might respond maybe to PPIs or to um, potassium um, um, antisecretary drugs like vonoprazan in Asia. However, in my experience, the presence of a large hiatus hernia, a higher a, a acid pocket within the hernia and the supine reflux are better managed by anti-reflux surgery, particularly if a patient is young and there are uh, no motility or other health-related contraindications for surgery. Uh, well, Prof, uh, we've had lots of questions. It was a very uh, concise presentation with two uh, tracings. Uh, we're about 25 minutes over schedule, but I uh, noticed there's still 81 people listening in. So hopefully it's been useful to the audience. And uh, uh, on behalf of SIMMED UK and the Chongqing Jinshan uh, Group Limited, I'd like to thank you for your presentation today. And hopefully we can do uh, some similar uh, training sessions in the near future. Thank okay. you very much, Prof. Thank you, and thank you all the participants um, for being there, for the questions, and if you would like to repeat and um, having more questions, it will be my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Prof. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.